Okay, I think we can start. So welcome to best practices for automating Azure with PowerShell and Azure CLI. If you are interested in a slide deck, you can take a photo of this because that's the only slide. The only thing that we will do now is uh, VS Code stuff and uh, go. So my name is Alexander Nikolic. I'm a PowerShell Azure trainer. I'm a Microsoft MVP, co-founder of PowerShellMagazine.com and one of the co-organizers of PowerShell Conference Europe. Does anyone plan to come to Europe to beautiful Prague? A couple of hands. Awesome. I'm looking forward to see you there. And I would like to start with the VS Code tip that it's absolutely not related to Azure, Azure PowerShell or Azure CLI that I really like. If you see this uh, long line here in uh, line four, there is that keyboard shortcut that can wrap it up softly and show you everything so you don't need to scroll. Alt C, magic, really. I hate it every time when I need to kind of scroll and see all that stuff. So we will start with some uh, uh, kind of basic uh, things, but I think it's uh, super important to know what are the options for us to learn Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI and uh, what the important articles to, to learn because I really believe the documentation plays an important part there. And documentation for Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI is becoming better and better every single day. And for Azure PowerShell in particular, we need to be thankful to Mike Robbins, who is here in the first row. And please, round of applause for Mike. joined the team uh, three years ago, and you can really see the improvements. Trust me, I'm spending a lot of time going through documentation, and the days before Mike and after Mike, very different stuff. So, when you talk about Azure PowerShell, Azure PowerShell works on PowerShell 5 and higher, and PowerShell 5. Well, one run works only on Windows, right, for the PowerShell 7, it works on any platform. If you want to use it on Windows, you also need to have a .NET framework, but that's connected to the requirements for a Windows PowerShell, not so much about the Azure PowerShell. The home of Azure PowerShell is the GitHub. Why is that important? Because it's open source, so every time when you have some issues, when you think that some bugs are there, and it's not the kind of a problem with your code, but they change something and things are not working properly, this is where you will go, right? This is where you will go also to check what others are saying, especially in the first couple of days after the new release. That's crucial, you know, to see immediately when something happens when they release new stuff. The release cadence is now once a month, and it's sync with Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell. This session will be about Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI, and you might think like, why Microsoft has two different tools with the same goal? To manage, deploy Azure resources. And the reason for it is that when they started with Azure PowerShell, Azure PowerShell worked only on Windows, okay? We didn't have cross-platform PowerShell. But Microsoft wanted Linux developers to also have a tool from command line to work with Azure, so they started working with Azure CLI. So now we have two, okay? The good thing is that now the same PM is for both of those tools, which will kind of be a guarantee that the quality of things in both of those tools will be the same. And the gap that exists right now in the coverage, in the behavior, certain other things will get narrower and narrower, which is always good for users, okay? Because we want to have an option to pick a tool to manage a service, not to be forced to use a certain tool just because we need to manage something. Okay? So for example, right now, if you want to manage Kubernetes services, 
you will probably go with the Azure CLI. Although they improved Azure PowerShell recently, but still Azure CLI is kind of better because it supports more different scenarios, right? If you are a consulting company and you have PowerShell experts in your team, and then your team is forced to use Azure CLI because your client uses the service that doesn't support fully PowerShell, but has better experience with Azure CLI, they will need to learn Azure CLI, right? So that's not something that we want, and that's not something that Microsoft wants as well, right? So this is where we are going kind of together in this, on this journey to make those things as same as possible or similar. So you will see some differences during my presentation, but those things will kind of change in the future. How many of you are Azure PowerShell users? Just to see. Okay. How many of you are Azure CLI users? A little less. Okay. Which is understandable. This is Azure PowerShell conference, not Azure CLI conference. So, okay. Uh, you can <clears throat> get AZ, AZ PowerShell uh, module from a gallery. For people that never tried it, I provided the installation uh, command, install module. And I want to stress the, here that uh, for Azure PowerShell and also for Azure CLI, it's very important to read release notes because changes are frequent and they are adding new stuff all the time. With Azure PowerShell, there is promise, and they're pretty good with that for a couple of years now, to introduce the baking changes by C. Okay? With Azure CLI, it's not like that. Almost every month, they induce some small breaking changes here and there. You might ask, like, why we as users are kind of okay for Azure CLI to break that much, but when Azure PowerShell breaks, then the Twitter burns, or any other social media. The thing is that People very often use Azure PowerShell for scripting and interactive usage, but Azure CLI mostly for interactive usage. Okay? So it, because they use it for interactive usage, if they see a problem or something that it's the consequence of a breaking change, they can, can adjust the command immediately. Okay? So that's not something that will break the CI CD thing for them. Also, I cannot doubt that because if you have something that works in CI CD and then they change it and then you get a new version of Azure CLI and your things will break, you will not be happy with it, right? So, uh, recommended way for installing Azure PowerShell is to get it from the other. You can also use the MSI file to install it on Windows PowerShell 5.1. Just be aware, if you use the MSI, it will always overwrite the previous version. When you use it from a gallery, you will get another new version next to the previous one you will have side by side. My recommendation is to keep at least two versions on the system. Why? In case that your scripts start breaking, you will need to run them in both versions to check if the problem was yours or the problem actually came from a bug that came with a new version and with some change that the team is not even aware, okay? Another thing that is really important here, you will, you will get this uh, demo file later, so you will need to kind of uh, take notes of all these links and stuff. Microsoft also nicely documented upcoming breaking changes. So you, you can prepare yourself for the changes. You can also get them very often as a warning messages when you run scripts. And you will be probably annoyed by them, really, but it's good that they are there. So that you know what's changing in the future and you can kind of prepare yourself for those changes. Also, every time when they release a breaking change release, you will know that because the major number in the version will change, they provide migration documentation as well. So that you will get nice tips of how to actually move to a new version. If you are using Azure PowerShell on your own machine, you are in control, right? So if you know that breaking change release 
is available, you will not rush immediately and get it, right? You will test it first. But there are certain environments where you don't have that control, right? And one of them is Cloud Shell, right? In Cloud Shell, which is managed environment provided by Azure to us, we don't have a control. When will they add the latest version of the system? But you still want your scripts to work, right? So it's kind of a crucial for you, even if you use it mostly on your own system, but you scan some things in a cloud shell to check the migration guides and see how those things are affecting you, right? And to start the test, just because we don't have full control, okay? Another document that is uh, very important now is the change that happened with Azure PowerShell when they moved from supporting Azure AD APIs to Microsoft Graph APIs. That change introduced some changes in the output objects, so you need to be aware of those. That's a kind of a separate issue to the migration that we need to do with all the Azure AD based scripts that we have and move to Microsoft Graph, which is much harder. Here, they also provide all the changes that happen, the changes in output objects, changes in the parameters, some of this are deprecated, right? So you just need to kind of be aware of that change. The Azure PowerShell team was the first that migrated to Microsoft Graph API. The Azure CLI team looked at it for a month to see what are the reactions from the users, and then they did the same, okay? So now both tools are basing all those uh, Azure AD related commands on Microsoft Graph APIs, okay? Uh, if you want to update, you have update module, AZ, and you will do it, really. To check the, the versions and, and the state of your machines, you can use get module with list available, or get installed module that will also give you the output. Do you have the Azure PowerShell modules installed or not. How many of you are still using Azure RM command lines? Anyone? That's good. That's good. Okay, we will skip that part because uh, trust me, in the real world, there is a lot of companies still working with it, and migration is important for them, and kind of a coexistence between Azure RM and the AC. And in this area, if you kind of have a client that still have Azure, just to be aware that I would recommend to you, if you need both, to install AZ, Azure PowerShell, latest versions and stuff, to PowerShell 7, and install Azure RM to Windows version. If you need to have them on the same machine, because they cannot run in the same session. But if you have one in Windows PowerShell and in the other in PowerShell 7, you can be assured that they will not conflict when you run stuff, okay? So we'll kind of skip that part. The same thing with uh, documentation, open source, GitHub repo applies to Azure CLI as well, and I've uh, collected the links for you to. One more thing that is kind of a very cool here with the Azure CLI is that Azure CLI provides easy upgrade command that can upgrade the Azure CLI and also the extensions that you already install machine. In Azure CLI world, extensions are like modules for Azure PowerShell. Okay? Additional functionality that's very often in a preview, right? So it's not part of the Azure CLI GI, GA release, but you will still kind of need them for certain things and you will use them so you can use easy upgrade to upgrade them. One interesting thing, and this is completely actually taken from a really good document, is how to remove Azure PowerShell if you have a need for it. You know? I will be sad if you do it, but they will be sad if you do it, but like they're out of the way. And because if you have multiple versions of the system, it can be really complicated. Recommended is to remove practically everything. And those are the steps for uh, doing it. 
So it's kind of cool that it's completely uh, documented and tested by Microsoft. I don't know if Mike is responsible for this code, but so I assume right, it is. All right, that code, so if you have any issues, let me know. <laughs> Okay, so I want to talk now about logging experience, okay? So usually people interact and connect to Azure using Connect AZ account, okay? That's like interactive way to do it. You will be prompted in a, in a window in a default browser to specify your uh, credentials and you will be logged in. One of the things that uh, I find kind of interesting here that uh, very often people struggle to uh, convert the secure string to a string. Because if you want to use it from a command line, with Azure CLI, for example, all the time, they ask for string for passwords and secrets, right? So I provided here a couple of uh, command uh, commands that you can use to actually convert secure string to a string that you can use without exposing it at the command line instead of typing so that it doesn't go to your history. There's one thing that is really interesting to me and I'm still puzzled by that, that uh, if you type your password in a PowerShell shell and it goes into history thanks to PS read line, Everyone will tell you that that's a bad practice, right? We are trained as PowerShell users to use secure strings, right? One of the easiest ways to do it is to kind of use a dummy username and create a get credential. And then from get credential, you will fetch the plain text password, right? Without typing it, so it's not visible there, it doesn't go to history. But very often when people use Linux and they are in a bash shell and they use the Azure CLI there, they, without any problems, type a password when they are asked. And I'm always curious why we have that difference in the culture. Like in, in Windows, like secure string, secure string, never ever type things. But in Bash, it's kind of like, okay. Think about the scenario when you are prompted in a browser to enter your credentials and you start typing your password and password is visible, you will freak out. Right? And you will go, oh, what's happening here? close the page, right, immediately. So why is it okay to then type the passwords at the command line? Still kind of a puzzle for me, but they say like, that's my least problem if they kind of own my machine already, kind of thing, right? I don't care. I'm not sure about that. Uh, <clears throat> now we have probably the easiest way to connect. We have connect AC account dash identity. If the system managed identity is enabled, in Azure VM, in Azure Arc enabled servers, in Azure Automation, that's the way how you will connect. You will not deal with secrets, okay? Outside of your environment, you will actually assign the roles to that managed identity so that you know that it's kind of a bad thing to assign a contributor on a scope subscription to a certain managed identities. You will go and follow the least privileged rule, right? And you will have better control on, on things. So many, if you can enable managed identities, if you can leverage managed identities in your environment, please do, okay? Very often what, what I do is, for my scripting environment, I'm adding my own machine to Azure Arc to get the system managed identity. Or what I now recommend to people to do Modernizing things is now uh, kind of an intern. They like, all like to modernize stuff. So modernizing your scripting environment. If you have all premises, a Jumbox server that your admins use to manage Azure or, or Microsoft Graph, a uh, much better way to do that is to onboard that machine to Azure Arc and then leverage Azure Automation to store your script in Azure Automation to leverage the managed identity, to use the Azure monitor to monitor the success or a failure of your scripts, to use the provided encrypted credentials in Azure Automation or use the Azure Key Vault, then to store hard code and 
do with other stuff with the sequence. Recently, I was in a, in a company when they told me that they are very aware that hard coding passwords in scripts is a bad thing. So what they did, next to their scripts, they have another textual file with a password, and they read it from the script. <laughs> so that reminded me of those people that were kind of aware of security issues, and they didn't put their passwords on a post-it, on a monitor. They hide it behind the mouse pad. <laughs> that's, that's how it worked when I was in Shrek. Uh, <clears throat> so when you deal with uh, CICD in a Azure DevOps pipeline or a GitHub Actions, then you need to also log in, right, to Azure to work on those things. Very often when you look at the tutorials for that, they will use the GUIs to set this thing up. Fortunately, it's possible to do all that stuff from PowerShell, actually. To fully, not fully automate for Azure DevOps, I couldn't find a way to actually assign permissions at the end, maybe Matthew, is familiar with that part and he has a solution for it. I can kind of set up everything and then at the end I need to go to GUI for that last part to assign permissions because I couldn't find a PowerShell way for doing that. What I really uh, prefer in this case is actually uh, how, to, how to deal with that with the GitHub Actions and I will, I will tell you why. In the GitHub Actions, if you ever set up the workflows for, for a GitHub Action, you know that if we want to use the logging action for it, they will tell you, you need to create uh, usually Azure underscore credentials variable. And that variable will contain information about your subscription ID, your client ID, your tenant ID, and the client secret, right? So they say, okay, create a new service principle, fetch the JSON output of it, and copy paste it to the GUI of GitHub repo, okay? And then it will work. The great thing is that you can do all that thing from PowerShell thanks to a PS Sodium module that a former PowerShell team member created, Tyler. I would like to say he created it for me because we had a conversation and he said like, I might have a solution for you and instead of you know, dealing with the sodium uh, DLL and doing all that stuff by yourself, Tyler was so good to create that module. It has only one command that you can actually see here, convert to sodium encrypted string, but it does the job, and that's awesome. Great. So what you do, you create a service principle, and as you can see, I'm one of those guys that like to mix and match Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI. So I find a way to create a service principle easier for using Azure CLI. And just like to warn you, if you try this command later, you will get a warning about the application of the dash dash SDK dash of grant. But if you go to the documentation in the GitHub, they will tell you Yes, there is a warning, but please use it <laughs> for now. We are working with Azure CLI team to kind of resolve that, but for certain reasons, we cannot recommend to use it, okay? So just use it as it is here, right? So what I'm doing now is like I'm extending the usage of us command line tools using GitHub CLI. So you go to your repo, and then you use a GitHub CLI to get a public key. I need one more information, encrypted value, and I'm getting that finally with the help of Tyler's command. And once when I'm done with that, I'm using again a GitHub CLI to finally create Azure credentials with just four lines of command line tools. Yeah? And I don't need to copy paste stuff and, and care about any of those. This works all the time, and once you have it, you don't need to even worry about that code. You will just kind of change the name of the service principle, and you are good. Okay? Very nice way to deal with that. Let's talk now about service coverage, default values, and how to provide feedback to teams, because that's very important part of our 
kind of a journey with all these things uh, with Microsoft and uh, managing the Azure resources. For service coverage, you can kind of easily uh, go and, and list all the services. You will see that every single service has its own volume. Maybe Michael knows the number for the current number of modules. So there's there's a lot of modules. I just put it that way. Yeah, yeah. 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 Because when, when you install AZ, you get all the GA modules. But there's also a module we release every month called AZ Preview, and that gives you all the previews and all the GA modules. So I didn't mention that. You have that AZ, which is GA. But there is a bunch of those modules that Microsoft created that are not GA. So you can use AZ Preview and get everything. Okay? So for example, I'm using the one for ARC, AZ Connected Machine. That's still not part of the AZ. I'm not sure about the resource graph. I think that that one is also still in Preview. I'm not kind of sure about that one, but it used to be in Preview for a long time. What I like to do very often in my environments is I like to set up some default values. Why? Because I hate retyping stuff, right? So I, if I work on a project and I know that I will concentrate for a week on just one resource group, I like that information to get from something instead of typing it all the time, right? So how we do it, usually, in PowerShell? We use PS default parameter values, right? Anyone is using that? In your profile scripts, oh, just a couple of hands. Really? That's a shame. It's super useful. I mean, it's like super useful. And here, the Azure PowerShell team provides a, a set easy default, which is kind of a great, but unfortunately, they are setting only one thing, resource group, nothing else. For some reason, they stopped. They had the idea to kind of get better with it, but then they stopped and, and only support that. The difference is that with PS default parameter values, that applies to all your sessions, everything you type. But the set AC default is a context aware. So when you change the subscription, then you can get different things. And for example, you can use PS parameter default values to specify that every time when you use get ACVM, the name of the resource group is a lab RG. Okay? And I'm showing here another technique that is really Pretty cool, and I think that I got that from Lee Holmes. I'm not sure anymore because I'm forgetting the sources of information if I don't take a note. Can you tell me what's happening here? How will that affect your environment? Can you repeat, please? Is that everything on every single manual is from Holmes? But something needs to be said. So. If you run before this command, if you run verbose equal true, that will be the trigger. Okay? Because if verbose is if variable verbose is not true, then the statement is false. And verbose will be false. The switch will be used, right? So when you want to have a verbose for a couple of your commands, not just one, you first say dash propose equals true, and then every command after that will actually use switch dash propose. Pretty cool technique for any other stuff. I really like that. Oh, so let me enable that. Okay, so uh, I will run this, and then I will set verbose to true, and you will be a little bit surprised, I think, with a couple of the outputs here. So if I run get AZVM, uh, right now, because I didn't enable another one, I've got everything. Oh, here it is, here. So let's just check if it's true. It is. Get AZ function app. Look at this. Can you imagine? They're setting like more than 10 global variables. Why? <laughs> I, I figured that yesterday. It was a surprise for me. Like, why they are doing that? Why they are polluting my system? <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, they are getting those variables in, in, in my session, right? They are changing the global variables. That's something that should not be used like that. I need to talk with the developer. 
I mean, it's kind of a surprise, right? I never ever told that they will do that. And I, I can just prove that. There's a lot of those here. They're just there. If you rerun it, you will not get it because they will check, and like, are they already there? If they are there, let's not use them. Right? So if I switch this to null and then rerun this, um, you will not get uh, any of those. Just this uh, progress thing. And, and this is also surprisingly like, a very slow thing. Right? I don't know if you experienced that before, but uh, the AZ in this case is much faster to give you a list of the function apps. For some reason, PowerShell is really slow doing that. I don't know why. Uh, on an Azure CLI side, there is AZ config set that can allow you to set lots of different things. And it's very well documented. So here you can just uh, see a couple of uh, examples of the things that you can do. You can uh, turn on or off the telemetry. You can uh, turn off the file logging, set location uh, for it, uh, define the default value for it. And the good thing is, and I will talk about it a little bit earlier, is they are leveraging the AI, not chat GPTs. They, they, they did it before all the craziness about that. Easy find, easy config will give you examples of how to use AC config. And you can use it for any command you want. AC find, AC VM list, AC account list, or whatever you want to do it. And you will get some examples with the help of AI. Very nice stuff. It's not like a predictor in Azure PowerShell that has its own value, but this is still uh, pretty cool. There's one thing that I really like as an experience here, something that it's really, really cool. They have a way to uh, specify how to deal with dynamic installation. What does that mean? You will try to run a command that it's actually not available at this moment in Azure CLI. And the Azure CLI is clever enough to recognize that that command belongs to extension. And you have a full control on it. Do you want to be prompted to install extension and then the command will run? Or it can run automatically if you need that in a CIC environment, for example, when you are not there to say yes. Okay? Very useful. So you might have a script when you just have a, some commands that belong to extension, not to original RCLI GA, and that will work. Very nice experience as well, right? So I can kind of show you that uh, very quickly. So. Now I set this to no, and then when I run, easy graph query uh, should not run on my system because I don't have, I remove this. And it will tell you like, oh, if the command is from the extension, please make sure that the corresponding extension is installed, so helpful links, how to do it, and all that. If I change it to prompt, and then run it again, it will tell me, Okay, this command belongs to resource graph. Do you want it? So, okay, I say yes. I say yes, and I will get it. And then, once when it's stolen, it will actually run the command. Great stuff. I would like to see that in PowerShell. Because we just joined by a PM for Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI tools, David Carroll. So, he's taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> to provide feedback to a team, send feedback, resolve easy error, very useful also to get the error messages because they will probably ask you for a little bit more of information what's happening there. And also for Azure CLI, there is a way to provide feedback that is it's kind of cool because uh, it's interactive. If something bad happens, uh, for example, then you can kind of uh, run it and it will give you a list or the things that you can do, create generic issue, or kind of, you see, failure, okay, one. And then it will open a GitHub repo in Azure CLI with the populated value of your environment. You don't need to retype that. Who likes to type all these things that Microsoft is asking for us? <laughs> no one, thank you. They don't even want to do it. So that, that's really, really cool. And this is one, one of the things that I just wanted to show you. If you are annoyed by uh, breaking changes warnings, this is how you get rid of it. 
You set item or you want to label. This is a little bit different syntax. Don't be kind of puzzled by that. Suppress Azure PowerShell breaking changes and warnings. You set that to true and you will not see it. Okay? If you don't like it. Persistent parameters is uh, one more thing in uh, Azure CLI that will allow you so that some of the parameters that you are using, like a resource group, location, storage account name, and some others, there's like six or seven of them, will be stored in a file, in a working directory, so that you don't need to retype all those things. So you may say, like, how is that different from an AZ config when we can define defaults? Think about those defaults with AZ config as a global default, and this one as a local default, right? for your working environment. I don't have a lot of time to kind of show you all, all of that, but it's kind of a very useful as well if you don't want to type all those things when you work uh, interactively with, with stuff. Also very well uh, documented thing, so it's not a... Uh, okay. So you've seen uh, a couple of those things, so I will not demo that part, but because you've seen it uh, with some demos with Jason Helmick, and things, so just be aware that those things are kind of <clears throat> enabled by default in a Cloud Shell environment. Uh, help files when you are at the end of the command or help for a parameter or just inline help for a parameter. And then you can also use the help A, help A to go from parameter to parameter, which kind of is super useful when you do the predictor and you get as the answer very long command. And then with the alt A, you switch from parameter to parameter that it's not your value, and then you change the value, and then you run. So you have a kind of good experience uh, with, with that. You've probably seen that a couple of times. So those things are already uh, demoed, a couple of things. One of the things that, that I would like to uh, show you in an Azure Cloud Shell, and you've seen Cloud Shell probably also a couple of times, is that uh, Cloud Shell is a browser-based environment that is populated with different tools that we can use. And we can access it from a browser, but you can also access it from a Windows terminal. There is a default, not default, but one of the profiles there for a Cloud Shell. And you can also use it in a VS Code if you install Azure account extension you will get access to it and you will just start it as another terminal. The magic there is that you can have a local file with your PowerShell, Azure PowerShell, Azure CLI commands. Look, you select command, run selection, over the wire it will be sent to your Cloud Shell terminal and execute in front of your right. Amazing stuff. You don't even need to have those things in that environment. You run it from a local file. What I want to show you here is um, the easiest way to upload a bulk of your script to Cloud Shell environment. The file share is supporting Cloud Shell. This is where we store our scripts, config files, additional PowerShell modules that we installed uh, in the environment. And if you want to upload a bunch of them instead of kind of a one by one kind of thing, there is this magic button here, connect, that will give you actually the commands that you need to run. You can just change the mapping ladder and it will then behave like you are on premises connecting and mapping your network share. If you want that to be persistent, just be aware to run this as a standard user. If you run it as a, in an elevated shell, it will not be visible in a file explorer. Okay? Because you cannot run right a file explorer elevated. Okay? So always run that as a standard user. You don't really need to know how it works. Right? You don't need a partial knowledge for it. If you work with the different systems, there is a code for Linux, there is a code for Mac. Great stuff. And you use that on your own machine, you send files, you take files, you don't need to worry even that those things are running in the cloud shell. Amazing stuff. 
super useful. Oh, let me show you this. I think this is, yeah, this is something that you would like to see. In a cloud shell, in a cloud shell, let me just clean this. If you have output that outputs an ID of your resource and you pipe that to a portal, what will happen is that it will open exactly in a portal where it is. You don't need to search for it. Did you like this? That's cool, right? Very cool stuff. And there's also a command called browse. So if you use browse and then pass the link, it will again use the same thing to open that in the tab. This is just amazingly good. If you have more than one, then you will get all those IDs and they will be actually clickable. So you can again open them directly in port. Very useful thing. Okay, we talked about that. So, one more thing that people are not aware. If you are in a cloud shell and you do control plus, control plus, control plus, everything will be increased except the fonts in the code editor. <laughs> If you want to increase the font in the code editor, you need to open command palette. In the command palette, type font, and it will give you this command for increasing it. And you will need to usually repeat it a couple of times because it's kind of going in the steps. Okay? That's kind of hidden uh, from us, but what can we do? That, that's it. So, uh, okay, I have four more minutes. So let, me, let me show you this. This is something that, uh, okay, I can actually show you this here. Okay. Let's say that I want to get a list of my VMs, and when I say a name here first, and let's say L, and then press tab or control space, I will get the list of all VMs that I have that start with L, okay? And then I accept one of them and I move to a resource group and then I say control space and I'll get all the resource group in my environment. This is not that efficient, right? But if I know the resource group, let's start with the resource group. So I say resource group let's say LA, tab, and then I say, so those are the VMs only in that resource group. I don't need to go through the full list. So always do that stuff. When you do the completion kind of thing, first go with the resource group, focus on that, and then ask for things. Much faster, and actually you don't need to look for it. This is what you're working with. Really cool. They added a couple of those nice, uh, completers and stuff, so that's something that, that I want. Okay, this is another one that is kind of cool. Let me show you that one too. Okay. Oh, here we go. See this. So here we have stop ACVM ID, and you know like IDs are those long, long lines. So here, with a star demo VM, I know that this is how partially my VMs are called. When I go with a tab, I'm going through all the VM with a demo VM in the name. And then I can then finally find one that I want and stop that machine. Okay? So that also works. Kind of a cool thing. Uh, for a troubleshooting, I want to kind of just say one thing. It's crucial for a single command to use dash debug or debug preference variable if you want to run it for more. This is something that the Azure PowerShell team and Azure, CLA, Azure PowerShell team will you ask you when you uh, find an issue for the things. And even for yourself, when you are not happy with the behavior, with the results, dash debug is the thing, right? You will be amazed with the amount of data that will come back to you, right? 
So there is uh, there is something that I wanted to show you. That I just need to find it very quickly because uh, I think that will be kind of a cool way to finish all this. Let me do it this way. Okay. So um, let's say easy easy VM list. If I do it like this, what I will get is the output is a JSON string, okay? Look at this. You pipe this to code hyphen. What happens is that will be open in a file. Much easier to browse, okay? If it doesn't open like this, if it opens just one line, very, very long line, you do this, right click, Form a document as long as it recognizes JSON, it will be formatted for you, and you can very easily browse that JSON string in the convenient Visual Studio Code editor. Very useful when you are dealing with the JSON element. Okay, you can do the magic with those piping to code hyphen because it always is redirected to a file. If you are happy with things, you can then save it, or you can just kind of browse it and go through it and it's pretty cool. So that's all that I prepared for you for today. I hope that you learn something useful. And uh, if not, we need to repeat the session next year and I will be back. <laughs> so thank you for your time and uh,